Yes. Thank you everyone for joining us today for our Friday lecture, uh, Modernizing Elites in Latin America, Social Network Evidence from the Emergence of Banking in Antioquia with Javier Mejia. Uh, for those of you who are joining us through the YouTube uh, channel, uh, thank you so much for, for being with us. Uh, I'm Alberto Diaz Calleros, Director of the Center for Latin American Studies at Stanford. Um, since this webinar is going to be live streamed, uh, we, we, we will continue the, the, the web page, our YouTube page will continue holding this lecture for the public, so you can visit it after the event. Uh, please do submit any questions you might have to the through the YouTube chat, and uh, I will make sure I read those questions in the QIA session uh, at the end of the talk. Um, I want to remind all of us, uh, as, as we usually do in our seminar, that we are here at Stanford at the land and the territory of the Ohlone original peoples. Uh, we offer gratitude for the land, for the water, uh, and the air that surrounds us. Today is Earth Day, so it's, uh, I think, a particularly uh, good day to think about that. And we want to also pay our respects uh, to the past, to the present, and to the future of the Ohlone and the Lenape peoples who continue to be present in this, their homelands, in these unceded lands, um, and throughout also their diasporas. Javier Mejia, uh, it's a pleasure to have you with us today here in person. Uh, I met him, I guess, a couple, no, before the pandemic, so already several years ago in a, in a wonderful conference in, 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 in Medellin. Um, in Medellin, is it? In Medellin. I was in Bogotá. In Bogotá, in Bogotá, that's right. I'm thinking of Medellin because of your work. Um, but he's a postdoctoral research fellow at the Political Science Department here at Stanford University. Uh, he's a member of the Stanford Civics Initiative. Um, he has been a lecturer and postdoctoral associate of economics at NYU, Abu Dhabi, and he has also been a visiting professor, uh, visiting scholar at the University of Bordeaux. Uh, he received his PhD from Nunez, from Universidad de Los Andes, and his work uh, focuses on this intersection between social networks and economic history. Um, he has an interest in not just Latin America, but also the Middle East, and he regularly contributes um, to open pieces, uh, so he's not a uh, sort of just a scholar in the ivory tower. He also engages in, in uh, contemporary issues related to um, economics, uh, business history, etc. So thank you so much, Javier, for being here with us today. Thank you, thank you. I want to take off my mask to make sure that you can hear me well. I'm very happy to be here. Um, I'm very glad to be presenting this paper specifically, which is part I guess it's a sort of spin-off of a project I've been working on for many years now. Alberto at some point had the pain of going through one draft of, of the, that project in which I tried to understand the role of networks in the emergence of entrepreneurship and from a historical perspective. And what I tried to do specifically in this paper is trying to think about how the elite in Latin America has evolved over time. And how it has adapted to modern times, right? And I think that's important because the elite is this classical theme in not only the history of Latin America, but even in the conjuncture. So most of the conversation nowadays around politics in Latin America has that figure of the elite. And it's frequently thought as this very static and monolithic creature that has been there pretty much in the same state since colonial times. And I'm going to show you that the story behind that is somewhat more complex. Okay? So let me try to begin motivating the issue even with a broader um, type of uh, interpretation, which com comes from the literature that tries to think about elites, right? So. There's an entire tradition that thinks about elites as a cohesive, homogeneous community. So if you think about the literature and economic history that tries to understand the emergence of modern capitalism, frequently they would tell you that the system that we live nowadays resulted from the interest of the bourgeoisie. And it's this social class well-defined that has common interests a very cohesive community, right? And that contrast with 
the literature that tells you about how entrepreneurs or businessmen interact in their daily lives. And also this is quite common if you look at business history. So what you see in that literature is that individuals in the elite are competing to each other to maintain their privilege and to expand and gain additional advantages, right? And the story behind creative destruction is a bit that. And I brought this current image just to like illustrate how this narrative is, right? You have these billionaires in at some level competing, right? So I guess the paradox behind this is how can you re reconcile those two views, right? How can you reconcile the fact that on a daily basis you have the members of the elite competing to each other, but in the broader picture they somehow coordinate and have impact um, in the entire system as a community. So what I tried to do in general in my agenda, but specifically in this paper, is trying to explore that, how you can sort of reconcile those two narratives. And what I do here is that I'm going to be looking at bankers as the specific part of the elite that, is, that everyone agrees that it's important in the transition to modern capitalism. Right? So everyone would say that financial capital is fundamental for the emergence of the economic system that we live nowadays. And I'm going to study bankers from an individual perspective. So I'm going to have individual level data, but I'm going to have these individuals in a network setting. So I'm going to be exploring how each of these individuals interact with the rest of the community. And the community is going to be represented by a network. I'm going to be studying that in one specific setting. That's going to be the modernization of Antioquia. This happens in the late 19th, early 20th centuries. I'm going to tell you more about this in a bit and why this is the right and uh, context for studying this question. I'm going to show you the data. I spent many years collecting the data. I'm very proud about them. So I'm going to know you a bit, telling you stories about the collection of the data. But I hope that that can inspire those of you who need to gather data like from a primary source, that it's probably worth doing it. Um, and I'm going to use conventional econometrics in a network setting to explore that data. This is not the paper that based like a particularly stringent attention to causality and identification. So if that's what you're interested in, probably you have some doubts about some of the claims that I'm going to be making. But some other parts of my agenda try to deal with that, right? So this paper is going to be part of a um, of a book that is aiming to a larger audience and the purpose is more of thought-provoking and, and generating questions than solving causal uh, controversies, right? But I'll be happy to talk about that one, just want to set the expectations. <laughs> um, I forgot to say you feel comfortable to interrupt me at any time. I know that we're going to have time at the end to chat, but um, I come from economics and we're trained to uh, an aggressive environment, which we're interrupted <laughs> very good. So. Take advantage of that. <laughs> Let me tell you a bit um, about the context and, and the data. So one of the good things of talking to people who are interested in Latin America is that I don't need to explain much about um, the setting. But for those of you who don't know, Antioquia is here in Colombia. This would be, I guess, the west uh, of Colombia, but it's up there at Los Andes, right? So Los Andes um, are quite a unique mountain chain until they arrive to Colombia and then they break into three different mountain chains. Antioquia is up there in the middle. It's hard to get there. That's one of the things that I want to transmit to you. The main city of Antioquia is Medellin. Probably you visited it or you're familiar with, with that. Um, but I'm, I'm, I want to transmit a bit the sense of what type of this place is. It's not Buenos Aires is not Santiago, is not Lima, it's not a place that it's easily reachable through sea, for instance. This was a very isolated place, not only from the rest of the world, but from the rest of Colombia, right? And I'm from this region and we have developed this even specific identity and we think we're somewhat different from the rest and that comes with a bunch of stereotypes which have good and bad things and I'm going to Talk about that. I mean, we can talk about that. I can tell you some jokes about that. <laughs> Centuries pass, and this community develops somewhat isolated from the rest. 
I guess that's the, me the main message. And that's gonna be important for um, what we're gonna be talking, and I'm gonna tell you that in a second. So why is important or what is, why can you argue that this is an appropriate thing to study the question that we have? Well, on the one hand, the modernization or the industrialization of Antioquia is considered one of the iconic um, episodes in Latin America. So for instance, Albert Hirschman used to talk about three main episodes of industrialization. He would talk about Sao Paulo, uh, Nuevo León, Monterrey in Mexico, and Antioquia. So these were places where you have the emergence of industry and a whole process of modernization that, that were not uh, connected to the political capitals and that took place under a very specific identity, like regional identity, right? So Antioch is one of those, and it resembles in many, way, in many ways all those other episodes. So Antioch was a traditional society during the entire colonial period, Actually, I could show you. Do I have? Can I? I'm going to move here. I'm going to click this um, button here so I can show you some images of this. But so, this is Medellin. I'm going to read back on the camera in a bit. This is Medellin in the 1860s, and what you can see is that it's a lovely village, right? And after a couple of generations, what you have is a fairly vibrant uh, city, right? And this is happening in other places of Latin America as well, right? So Monterrey, I could show you something equivalent for Monterrey or so probably if, if you want, right? Um, let me get back to what's here. So what I'm trying to tell you here is that if you study this episode, you can say or at least learn probably things of other regions um, in Latin America, right? So this traditional society fairly rapidly transit to a modern society and that came with an industrialization process. That industrialization process, which uh, was characterized for the creation of companies that produce this type of uh, simple product. So think about the first industrial revolution type of uh, production that had a market that was mainly regional and, and national, right? So we're not thinking, we're not talking about gigantic firms that are producing for the world, but for the region. But still, that was a profound structural change for the economy and the society of this region. So Antioquia is very similar to all these episodes, but it's very similar in one dimension. And I hope that this is the last time I am I'm moving around that much, but it's different from the rest of the industrial poles of Latin America by its um, local, uh, let's say, uh, soil, right? So in contrast to what happens in the rest of the Americas where industry emerges and modernization, therefore, from an important influence from migrants and in foreign firms, that's not the case in Antioquia, right? So if you look, so Antioquia is here, what you have uh, here are basically the fraction of owners that were immigrants of these industrial companies. In Antioquia, that was 5%, so it was a clear minority, and even if you control for the number of, of or the population of immigrants in the region, that's still low, right? Because it's true already that that many people want to go to Colombia, and less to Antioquia, because again, this was up there in the mountains, and it was very far. And why is that important? Well, that's important because that gives a very specific advantage for this effort of thinking about the role of the elite. So what I'm going to tell you is that the modernization of this region is going to be the result of the elite of this region. And an elite that was quite isolated from the rest of the world and from the rest of the country, right? And that's important because that's going to make feasible the whole idea of constructing the network of this community. Because if you're familiar with social network, maybe you've heard of the six degree of separation hypothesis mm -hmm. or the small world uh, theory that basically describes that the human network is much better connected than what we think. So an average, based on some studies, we're about six steps away from anyone. So from Obama, we're not a hundred steps away, like through a few set of steps we could reach out about, right? 
And that's a problem because then if you want to reconstruct the entire network of a community, that implies that you would have to reconstruct the network of the entire world. And that's not feasible, at least not with the technology that we have nowadays, right? If it's feasible, it is in this setting where you have a fairly isolated community. Just like that. Yes, so so you feel comfortable as though you yes. were with economists. <laughs> <laughs> I'll interrupt you with a question. But I wanted to ask you, do you really believe this is a late industrialization? Since you just showed us the slide of 1880s, and I guess Hirschman was thinking about it as a late industrialization compared to Europe in the 1840s, but Nowadays, I don't think it's late. It's very yeah, early. I agree. I, I, agree. I yeah. think it's late for the European conversation yeah. on industrialization, but for the uh, for E three, it's it's fairly early. I agree. I agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what I do, and I hope that you're somewhat convinced that this is a an interesting setting to uh, ask this question. Um, is that I'm going to show you data on individuals, people of, that were part of the elite of this region that live is around this period. I'm going to be more precise in a bit. And what I did was that I spent many years in archives collecting information about them and specifically collecting information about their interactions with between each other. So what I end up having is this network of something like 100,000 ties um, and I'm going to explore that information, okay? So how does that data look like? So basically I have two uh, data sets, both of them like I collected uh, uh, on my own. One is data on the banks, so during this period you have 24 banks that were created and I know where they were located, when they were created, uh, what was the capital that um, was used to be to found it, who were the partners. I'm going to know a bit of their profits and I'm going to know a bit how well they did, right? That's one part, it's the, like a firm level data set. And then there's the relational data, so this is the network. This comes from uh, a search that resulted from more than 100 primary sources, this implied looking and spending a lot of time in uh, 15 archives and doing an extensive uh, um, search for secondary sources. And I construct a network. How do I construct a network? I uh, use two complementary approaches. So the first one is uh, what you could call a sending sampling approach. This is the type of methods that you would use in the peer effects literature. Um, so what does this mean? So I'm interested in my population of interest is the elite, right? So I'm going to be looking at spheres of interaction where I'm expected to find these people. So for instance, uh, an elite school, and I'm going to say that individuals that went to the same school, same cohort, they're going to be connected, right? That approach has a bunch of problems. One of them is that it doesn't capture social spheres of interaction. Uh, private spheres of interaction, I'm sorry, only social or uh, public spheres, right? And among the many problems that come with that is that in this context, for instance, women didn't have a particularly salient role in public spheres of interactions, so you don't get almost any women through this approach, right? So that's one of the reasons why I complement the data collection with an ascending sampling approach. This is basically as noble, and this is extensively used in the social network literature and sociology. And if you're trying to study hidden population, like criminals or something like that, you use this type of approach. What's the logic of this? You think about people that are fairly well connected. You go and you talk to them and then you ask them, hey, nominate some people that are connected to you. You go, you talk to that people and you ask them, nominate some people. And that's how you grow the network. That's a noble part of it, right? So what I did is that I... Uh, look at the four largest shareholders of the banking system in 1888 and I look to who they were connected with and then I look for those people and I reproduce that and eventually there's some uh, uh, boundaries that well, keep the data limited but that, that's the logic. That's great because on the one hand well I can have information on private spheres of interaction so here I have information on family and friends and well pretty much all the women in my sample come from this method uh, because women also were particularly important bridging the network, right? So in addition to, well, their performance in, in other spheres, but 
having them is important, is what I'm trying to tell you, if it's not obvious on, on its own. Um, and also, as I'm following each individual, and I'm identifying them um, well, I can track individual attributes. And that's going to be useful because I'm going to tell you that I'm going to be comparing similar people, and it's because I was able to check who they were exactly and how they did it. Okay. Just to highlight a bit how the process of this uh, took place, so I looked literally to hundreds of sources. An important source was uh, genealogical books, so it's great that in the Hispanic tradition we're quite obsessed with, with lineages, as in other traditions, but probably you're familiar with this. And there's, been that, there's, there's people that have spent their entire lives collecting information on this, and they basically publish books on this. So I looked to all the genealogies in, in that exist for this region. This is how most of them look like. Um, you have information. This is the, 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 the page that has information of the first Mejia that arrives to Antioquia. It basically says, has the complete name of the guy, some biographical information, the complete name of his wife, of his wife, um, information of his offspring, and a sort of ID that tells you that similar information for this person is going to appear in this input, right? So I use that. These type of sources have a bunch of problems because, well, there are a bunch of biases why you track some people and not other. So I complemented that with data from uh, baptism records. This setting is very useful because basically everyone here is Catholic. And if you're familiar with Catholicism, you're supposed to be baptized as soon as possible, otherwise you get sick and you die. That's what my mom used to say. So <laughs> this is almost a census, right? And the information that you have is the name of the kid. And it's great, and I'm going to tell you why this is important. You have the entire name of the kid, which is Maria de la Soledad, the entire name of their parents um, and their grandparents. This is important because your name, Maria de la Soledad, and everyone calls you like that when you're a baby, but then you grow up and then you sign documents as Maria. But you have three other sisters that are Maria, no one is Maria Alejandra, Maria or Catalina, and then it's hard to know who's who, right? So there's a big challenge here of matching data across different sources, and this type of information is going to be useful, and I'm going to tell you that at the end of your life, your full names like show up again, and that's how partly how I solve the matching challenges. But I use that genealogical information. I also use business information. Most of them comes from uh, constitution documents. I think this is the constitution document of one of these banks. So we have here information on the name of the shareholders, what the company did, the capital that, uh, and then some other features, the board of directors, uh, etc. I coded some qualitative information, so there are narratives of the period. So there's people that say like, oh, in Medellin, we used to go to parties and do this and that. And you can track information, and I coded that qualitative information that described social interactions. As I told you, there's this gigantic challenge in matching across sources. Nowadays, I keep working on similar stuff and they're, like the technology in this sense has improved dramatically. So now there are algorithms and you can use machine learning to do these things. But I did this manually back then and one of the things that I did was go to the cemetery where most of this elite was buried and that was extremely useful because you have your entire name when you're born and when you die, basically. And you're usually buried with your family, your wife, your children. And that is very helpful to distinguish then which of the Marias you're looking at, right? So this is the Maria that died in this year that was married with this and not the other Maria that is on the other side of the cemetery and so on. Um, how did I construct the networks? And I'm going to move very rapidly uh, so I have time to show you some results. Uh, basically, I thought of specific dimensions of interactions that were as exhaustive as possible. Um, so I have seven dimensions of interaction, a family network, a political network, um, sort of civics um, uh, network. And I define specific criteria to identify what a connection was, right? So the family network are people that are connected if they're parents, couples, children, or, or siblings, right? 
the political network is people that had uh, were in public office at some point in their lives, and they're connected if they were part of the same cabinet or if they were direct bosses or subordinates. I want you to notice that this is much rigorous or like narrow than what frequently you see when people talk about networks, right? Very frequently people show political networks and they're just affiliation to the same political party, which does, doesn't necessarily imply a social interaction, right? In this case, what I'm saying is I'm having information that very certainly describes that these people know each other and talk to each other and exchange information and resources, right? And well, each dimension had different criteria. Based on that, you have different networks. This is the family network, so each dot is an individual, and each of those blurry lines um, is uh, a connection between them. This is the family network that's different from the intellectual network, because you have different people connected differently. And eventually, what I do is that I collapse that information, right? And I wait by the number of dimensions you're connected to. So if you're a family member, but also you are doing business together, then your connection is stronger than if you're not, um, and so on. This network evolves in time, um, so I'm able to track this decade by decade. I'm like showing you this rapidly, but just I want you to notice how this densifies as um, the snowball grows and eventually it vanishes as I start following people. What I do is that I get rid of the tails of those distributions and I focus from 1870 to 1931 is when I report information on that, right? And where I have like good data on, on, on social networks. You have questions about this so far? Because I'm gonna start talking about now, uh, I'm gonna start talking about banks, right? So what happens with, so basically credit was controlled by, church, by, by the church until the mid 19th century. Right. There were a bunch of different efforts to create banks in, in Colombia during that period, but none of that was very successful until the 1870s. And this time you have the consolidation of the federal liberal government, which is something similar as in other places of, of the region. And they fostered the emergence of a free banking system that has strong regional components. Right. And this means that banks can issue currency. So the first banks that you have here that are created by local states and by merchants and miners are banks that can print money and this money would circulate just as official currency, right? This was functional because if you were a miner, then you can use gold to trade abroad, for instance, and you could um, keep it while circulating cash and well, you can leverage yourself in that way, right? So it was usually the motivation behind that. You have then like a first boom in the emergence of banks. So you have the creation of about eight banks in Antioquia. Those banks, most of them would eventually close when the centralist government arrives in the 80s and they create a national bank. And that basically ruins this, the, the potential benefits of the opportunities that resulted from free banking. And then, well, that experiment doesn't go very well, there's a fairly high inflation and, and so on, but things change when in the um, first, uh, the last years of the 19th century and the first years of the 20th century, there's a big war. Like again, one of these wars between federalists, centralists, liberals, conservatives. This was the largest civil war in Colombia and there was uh, hyperinflation. There was a great opportunity for making money as most wars are, um, and that came with an expansion in the creation of, of banks. There was a boom in banking uh, creation. What did these do, banks do? They would basically speculate with the exchange rate. So if you have hyperinflation, you can basically play with the fact that tomorrow, uh, well, the exchange rate could be twice as high, and that those are like represents great um, uh, opportunities. Things stabilize after the war, and most of those banks close their doors. And then there's a final boom. And here I'm trying to describe it. There was a cyclical pattern, the emergence of uh, and, 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 and the closure of banks. You have a final cycle of expansion of banks. 
there are more banks than you what you would call now investment banks. So these were banks that were investing in these early industrial firms, right? So they were not speculating that much. They were not printing money. They were investing in the real sector. And industry is booming here. Um, how did the elite think and of creating these banks and how did they control it? I want to highlight here that banking has almost by nature a collective nature, so or like a collective essence. So the banking business is pretty much gathering money from a bunch of people and lend it to those that need it, right? So it's very hard to have you yourself, your just your bank, right? So there's a cooperative dimension to it. And that leads to all these challenge, challenges around cooperation, right? So you have the emergence first of some family banks, so you might not be able to see, but this is Restrepo and Compañía. Uh, Vicente Bevilla e Hijos, Botero Arango e Hijos. It's basically someone with his children and some other people that say like, okay, we're enough people here, we have enough, pe enough money, we're gonna create this bank. However, you also have the first corporations that emerge in this period, and here you start to see some of the signals of a new economic system, right? So a system that start to be based on uh, anonymous interactions, right? So you have some uh, banks like Banco de Medellin that has hundreds of shareholders. And when you have corporations, then the question is how can you control a corporation? The way that this happened was that commercial houses that were the traditional uh, business unit during this period that were not fundamentally different from this idea of banks. Basically, was someone, this, this is Vasquez Correa y Compañía, uh, Sierra Jaramillo y Compañía. Basically, association between one or two families. Frequently, there was a, a capital partner and there was a labor partner. So it was a rich dude that said like, okay, I have money, you can work, we can make this store we are now this entity. What they did is that through that entity, they would have shares in many of these banks and through that they would put people in the board and that's, I'm gonna give you like one specific example. I just wanna frame a bit how the ownership structure and the management structure uh, took place. Now, so when you start to think about bankers, probably the first thing is to think about who they were. So I do here a very simple exercise, which is that I compare the observables of bankers and the rest of the elite, and I compare that with how industrialists look compared with the rest of the elite. Right? So these stars uh, basically show you there are a significant difference between these two communities. Um, and you can tell that, well, bankers were more mostly men, although, well, the rest of the elite as well because of the biases that I was anticipating already. Um, but I want to highlight, and there are a bunch of similarities, but I want to highlight and there are a few messages that I want to transmit. So first, if you think about education, here you have information about which of these individuals pursue higher education. What you can tell is that bankers significant, were significantly less educated than the average member of the elite, while industrialists had the opposite feature, right? Um, when you look at the wealth before modernity, if you want, what you have is that bankers were wealthier. Industrialists, apparently not, right? When you look if they have lived abroad, you see that in general bankers did not, while industrialists did, right? So what I'm trying to point out here is that if anything, bankers seem to be more like the traditional lead, less exposed to the world, less educated, while industrialist seems to be the opposite. There's, that's a first message. But I want to point out that, and this is one of the motivations of the paper, that it's hard to talk about this as homogeneous communities. So I'm talking like the previous graph, the previous chart was, the previous table was telling you about the average banker, right? But to begin with, one should expect that there's heterogeneity within this community. I want to signal some of that heterogeneity. So when you look at the capital uh, distribution, you can see that it's remarkably skewed, right? So the medium banker had invested about 800 pesos. That's something like 20 times the GDP per capita. So about 20 times what a normal person would make in a year. So you can already tell that 
this is the elite. These are particularly wealthy people, right? However, you can tell that if you look at the top distribution, you have much either wealthier or people much eager to invest in this um, activity, right? So the top 10% of uh, the largest shareholders in the system had uh, more than 10 times what the median banker had. And if you look at the top 1%, well, that figure escalates even more, right? So what the way in which I frame this is that most of the bankers were rentiers. There were people that were wealthy, they felt like they could invest in this new sector that was expanding, that was a good uh, business opportunity, and they were happy doing that, right? Buying some shares of Banco de Medellin and then just letting that provide some dividends at, at the end of the period. And you had a few people that were really invested, uh, that had large stocks um, um, at stake in, in these new companies, and you could call them banking entrepreneurs, right? And they were different because they had active role in the investment, right? So a way in which you can sort of uh, evidence that is the not only the amount of investment invested, but you can see how there's a correlation with that and the likelihood to be on the board, right? So I can tell you that, uh, and again, like the Be careful with like the cause interpretation here, but like the association here is basically that if you like the people that had invested one thousand pesos more uh, in the mean would be uh, about zero point seven um, percent more likely to be part of the of the board, right? Um, and you can start to see other things. You see that those bankers that were also industrialists seem to be more entrepreneurs than rent teams, right? So one thing that you can observe is that industrialists that had uh, stocks in banks had about twice what non-industrialists had. And this is going to be important because I'm going to try to describe you how eventually you're going to have these different communities amalgamating to each other. So they are different. They're different people. But they're interacting, they're having business to each other, and they're marrying people across families and so on. That's how the story is going to flow. But industrialists were rather entrepreneurs, banking entrepreneurs, than banking rent keepers, right? And you also see how industrialists were more likely to be in the board that, of, of these banks than non-industrialists, okay? To be probably more intuitive how did this work and why would like an industrialist be interested in owning stocks of a bank and not just owning stocks but controlling what these banks did. This is the example of one uh, conglomerate. So this is Vasquez Correa um, and the Banco de Sucre. Both of these were banks, right? Both of them were owned by mostly the Vasquez and the Correas, right? This is Vasquez Correa and this is Banco de Sucre. These are companies, the blue ones, that were owned by the banks or where the bank had a large uh, uh, part of in the, in the ownership. And many of these companies are non-financial companies, right? So Ciudad Pecuaria, Antioquia, this is an agricultural company. But you have here uh, a hotel, you have a, a developing uh, company, you have a beer company. So this is these are investments in the real sector, most of them on this emerging industrial sector that is it's, uh, expanding during during this period. So basically what you have is that, that these families invested in these collective projects and made an effort to make decisions on the board in order to use those collective resources to leverage some of their other businesses, right? So. These other red dots basically tell you that these are some of the other members of the elite that had <coughs> property in these companies, right? So these were companies where the Vasquez and the Correas, aside from their banks, had interest in, right? We're going to get back to that in a bit. Before that, um, I, wanna, I want to show you what was important in terms of the network to end up being a banker. Again, 
everyone here is part of the elite, right? But you can be many different things within the elite, right? You could be, as most of them have been for centuries, farmers, miners, but some of them decide to invest and some of them much more intensively in the banking system, right? And what you see if you put this in a oiler setting with like a bunch of controls and a reasonable um, regression, you have, there's just one specific feature of the network that seemed to matter in order to be more invested in the banking sector and that's the degree. What's the degree? The number of connections that you have, right? What does this mean? That the more connections that you have, the more likely you were to be a banker and the more likely you were to have more money in the bank. There are causality issues here. I explored that, exploiting the timing of this. So I could tell you that if you take lags of this variable, uh, you see this pattern. So I'm, what I'm trying to say is that this is not a story of bankers having more connections because they're bankers, but the other way around. People that had more connections were more likely to be bankers afterwards. And I can show you some of like the results of that, but I hope that you believe in what I'm telling you at the moment. I want you to contrast that with this data. This comes from another paper, so from one of the, my papers in which I explore what happens with industrialism. But with when you're looking not at people that create banks, but people that create industrial companies, what you have is that degree doesn't matter, local connectivity in general doesn't matter. What seems to matter is global connectivity. So what this graph shows you is a very specific exercise in which I explored the, an exogenous shock to the network, so basically someone dies unexpectedly, and that represents a uh, exogenous shock to your position in the network. So someone in this room dies, for example, I hope that that's not the case. But if that happens, um, our position in the network is going to change. Our connectivity at global level is going to change because that person was potentially a bridge between two others, and if that person doesn't exist, maybe now we're a bridge. right? So the result in that paper is that when you have an increase because of that exogenous factor of your global connectivity, of your capacity to connect different parts of the network, so connecting the miners with the politicians, uh, with the bankers, with the merchants, you end up investing more and creating more industrial firms, systematically decade by decade. That's not the case when you look at bankers. So what matters for banking is to have a bunch of friends. Now, to have global connectivity. For industry, global connectivity is what matters, right? So what seems to be the story here, and here I'm speculating, I don't have like a proper test for this, but it's what seems most reasonable to me, is that banking is an investment opportunity that is not available, however, for everyone, right? So think about, for instance, the venture capital environment in the Silicon Valley. There are startups all the time. There are unicorns out there. But we could, there's people investing in those unicorns. But we are not. You need to have the opportunity to be part of one of these rounds of fundraising in order to do that. And you need to know people for doing that. The more people you know, the more of those opportunities you can have. right? And that's what creating a bank is during this period. There are these extraordinary investment opportunities. And if you know a lot of people, you're more likely to be part of those initiatives and you're more likely to have more money put on that. That's different than creating an industrial company. So creating an industrial company is a process in which it's not only money what is needed. To so create an industrial company in this context requires for you to bring the machinery from Europe. It requires you to hire someone that knows how to operate the machine. It requires to find someone that knows how to train the workers to operate in an environment that they're completely unfamiliar with. You're doing things in which you need other resources, and those resources are not available in the marketplace. So you don't have FedEx, you don't have Google, you don't, so how do you get the machine? You need to know someone that is used to bring pianos, and that's how you bring the machine, but how do you find an engineer? Well, you need to be connected with someone that can send someone to a school here. 
And by the way, one of these early industrialists were part of the first cohort of people at Berkeley, which is a funny story. Anyway, so those are different type of productive challenges and different type of positions in the network allow you to solve those problems better than others, right? And this is already signaling how these people, again, were part of the same community, they were part of the elite, but they were doing different things because they had different positions in the network, right? So this is enriching the narrative of a heterogeneous uh, community. However, being having a bunch of connections was not enough for being a successful banker. So if you have many connections and you had a high degree, you were more likely to have in investments in the banking sector. But if you look at the outcome of your investments, and here we don't have exactly the profits of your portfolio, but we know how well the banks where you invested did in terms of how long they lasted and how, how well they dealt with crisis. And that's, so that's the outcome variable here and the outcome variable here. So this is, this is a coefficient plot. So basically it's telling you that if you replicate this regressions that are behind all our charts, and you look at this specific variable, so this look at if you're a politician, or if you're an engineer of a minor, or if you have a given degree, or how far you are from other people. So how many steps away you are from a politician or from a military member. How does that affect or how that is correlated to the performance of your banking portfolio, right? Again, these two charts represent different outcome variables, but the, both of them represent how successful was your portfolio. And there are two takes away here, so don't get intimidated by like the, so it has a lot of things, but there are like two big messages. So the first one is that if you were an industrialist, in general, your portfolio did well regardless of how you measure it, your banking portfolio. Not only if you were industrialist, but if you were close to an industrialist. Probably you were not industrialist, but your brother-in-law was, right? So that's one step away. The closer an industrialist was in your network, the better your portfolio did. What makes your portfolio worse seems to be being a politician or being close to a politician, which I don't know if you would expect this, but it feels a bit Counterintuitive. It seems that anyone who's connected with a politician is supposed to do better in life at every level. And I think that actually that's not necessarily the case if you think about it for a second. And I can speculate a bit about this, but what seems most likely is that if you were very close to, politici to a politician or you were a politician, probably you were investing in these banks that were influenced by political parties that were in power. And you have a very volatile political environment. So tomorrow, your friends were not in power, and then your bank was not doing that well, right? However, if you were industrialist or you were close to the industrialist, basically you could have banks that were more robust that could use those resources in real productive activities that were exploding every specific timing of, of the economic cycle, right? Let me start like wrapping up with the last uh, section. And here what I tried to do is try to describe you how, although you have, I've been emphasizing these distinctions between the industrialists and the bankers and how they were different, but they were, I told you, like the industrialists were bankers at the same time, and there were certain type of bankers that were interested in taking decisions and the board, right? And what seems to have been happening is that you have that traditional leads were moving into the banking industry and eventually they would amalgamate with this industrialists that were coming from experiences abroad with the knowledge of modern economies and so on. So this is, I'm gonna tell you the story of two individuals. So bear with me here. So this is Vicente Bebilla Gomez. So notice he was so he's a person from the early 19th century, right? Has some kids, da da da. And here is another person from that same generation. They were this, they were merchant traders, they were people from these villages that they 
demonic trading and creating banks, right? This was the first generation that had banks, and they had banks because that was useful for their mining trading uh, needs, right? And their kids married to each other, so the two, like this arrow, I did this chart just a few hours ago, so probably it's not very well done. These two of them got married, and they had this kid, so now we're moving a generation, right? And here in this generation, you already have people that are only bankers. They have left behind a bit this other merchant type of activities, right? And now the grandchildren of this guy, they're highly invested in industry. Some of them keep uh, interest in banking. Um, some of them do not. And they start to interact with some other families that follow similar patterns. So these are the Chavarrias, and I don't want to make this too niche, but there was this very salient, like one of the most iconic uh, companies in, of the industrialization of Colombia was named Coltejer. It was founded by these three groups, basically the grandchildren of this guy who was also Vicente Bevilla. So you feel a bit here like in a hundred years of solitude environment. Right? <laughs> Aureliano here, Aureliano there. Um, and um, he got married with Ana and Lucia, not at the same time, of course. <laughs> but one passed away and he couldn't find someone else. He had to marry her sister, of course. <laughs> and... <laughs> And he was the, the head of that uh, company. It was an industrial textile company. The tallest building still in Medellin. It's called Coltejer, and it's shaped as, uh, um, as one of the textile machines. Uh, um, but then that, that Coltejer was created by this family of Alejandro Chavarria and him. And these guys were bankers, and they were associated as bankers in this generation. And the brother Alejandro Chavarria had these other kids that uh, created with this Lazaro Mejia, this industrial company. And Lazaro Mejia was also a banker in the previous generation, right? And he was the brother of this Maria Mejia, who was also a banker during that period, right? And he was the dad of this guy who eventually, this is like a Howard Hughes Colombian version, <laughs> right? So he created the first like uh, airline and then he was into movies as well and so on. Um, and his daughters were married eventually with this other banker. And you can have here other families that are connected. The, the broad story is you have this generation of bankers that seem to transit after years into industrialism, and eventually that identity wraps up. And this, in the 20th century, they would talk about the industrial elite of Antioch. And even today, they talk about them as... So when they think about the wealthy people of Colombia, they think about the industrialists that emerged during this period. I want to show you like a narrow part of that story, right? So let's de-escalate the dimensionality of networks here. And look at, so this is the inventory of the, of the testament of Julian Vasquez and Vicente Bevilla Jr. Right, so the, uh, the grandfather and the grandchildren, right? And what you have is that this guy that died in the late 19th century had most of his money in loans. These are personal loans. Basically, it says, I quoted this. It, it's actually very annoying. Like, how, I don't know how many pesos to this person, how many pesos to this person, right? Which is, it feels very sad, you know? You died and you, most of your money is like owned by someone else in a certain way, right? Uh, and the rest of his assets were, you know, animals, so cows, horses, blah, 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 blah. There's a lot of cash, merchandise, lots of real estate, a good part of that in rural areas, and stocks of, of banks, right? When you move a couple of generations, you have that this, um, this Vicente Bevilla is deeply invested basically in industry, right? So you don't only have a change in sectors, which is clear, so we had still some in banking and loans you could... Imagine, but it's also the composition of it, right? So what you have here are basically literally stocks of companies. So you have that this corporatization of the economy has taken place. And these families in a certain way have moved in that direction through these mechanisms that I've been um, um, explained to you. So let me try to wrap up and try to put together all these pieces to like give you a sort of coherent story here. So the first thing is that 
when you think about bankers, although you feel very tempted to say like all the bankers, as is they were the same people in the same room, they were fairly diverse, right? I've been trying to show you that, right? So the average banker probably was fairly standard and could be described as a late remainder of the traditional elite, very connected to the rural economy. Um, but there's a lot of heterogeneity uh, inside it, and you have this massive, massive rentiers and a small part of this banking entrepreneurs. But eventually you have that banker start to amalgamate to other parts of the elite. So you have that sort of simultaneously there are these industrialists that are emerging. Again, they're better educated. They have experience abroad. Um, they're less connected with this traditional economy. But they start to connect, right? And why do they do that? Well, because it was profitable. So I show you how bankers needed this business opportunities that industrialists were bringing. And evidence of that is that they were, if, they, if these bankers were also industrialists or they were close to them, they would do better. Their banking business was doing better, right? So it makes sense that in the long term, like people are smart, right? If they realize that those that are connected to industrialists are doing better, it's very likely that they want to move in that direction. But it's not only that, industrialists also needed um, needed bankers. So when I show you these baskets and Correas, they needed the resources from the banks to support their industrial initiatives, right? And I want you to notice that this amalgamation happened through two differential mechanisms. So you have social mechanisms, so you have these marriages, like pattern that I described to you, you know, my daughter marries your son and now we're the same thing and we create this company together. But you also have economic mechanism. So you have how these commercial houses are literally trying to control these like new corporations to channel resources from them to their own uh, projects. Okay? And there's this issue about how network matter, uh, the network matter, so higher local connectivity seems to have been fundamental to be inserted in the banking business. But I told you, for the industrial sector, it was a different thing. However, although connectivity at local level was important for having access to those investment opportunities, it was not enough to bring good performance to those investments, which that sounds also trivial. Again, when people think about how the elite makes business, it's like you put money and the money just reproduces itself because you're part of the elite. When you're trying to generate money, you're dealing with like the forces of the market, right? And here you have this challenge of how to make profitable your investments. And there, there were these challenges that implied, for instance, ways of solving that was connecting with industrialists and not with politicians that didn't seem as appropriate in that context, right? And here's how social proximity plays, some, uh, plays a role, right? Let me say, and this is the last slide, I, I want to say how, for, I guess, what we could learn from this paper if you're having a broader interest in the elites and in Latin America, right? So I think the first part of it is that this paper brings a non-political kind of understanding of why elites have persisted. Uh, because it's true that when you look at Latin America, you have these traditional families that have been there pretty much forever. And usually the narrative is that they captured the political establishment and then they've made their way easy every generation, right? Here the stories look, look somewhat different. What you have are businessmen trying to adapt to the different opportunities that uh, different times are generating and they're using their businesses and their social connections to navigate those uh, changing environments, right? So you don't have exactly a solid elite that stays there. You have a more fluid type of dynamics. You have some people that are here, then they're not, but some fraction and lineages of those families persist, some other vanishes. So it's a much more fluid environment that I think that would be appropriate to understand and to realize how modernizing times have some impact in, in the challenges that these uh, communities have. So I, I'm 
I don't know if optimistic, but I'd like to think that there are new avenues that should be pursued and that the coming years are, are good in that sense. So I think that we need to start analyzing the elites of Latin America from an individual level perspective. I think we need to have more data of individuals uh, of the elite, which is something that coincides with some other interests. Many, some of you are interested in inequality, for instance. And now we have this concern of knowing who's wealthy, how much wealth this person has, and that's a current issue, right? So even that, at a historical uh, level, but a, at a current level, that's something that is very important. Um, and this research of, uh, this avenues of research probably are appropriate to be uh, articulating local levels with national levels, and this specific regional case, I hope that contributes to that. And finally, I think that this type of research helps to uh, push the conversation around how elites use social mechanisms, right? And this should push us to think about what family does, for instance. What does it mean? What role it plays in the perpetuation of privileges and, and the consolidation of, of the elites, right? And with that, I finish. I am here and I'm happy to uh, receive questions, comments. So, Javier, I'm going to, because we have gone on the limit of the time on the YouTube broadcast, so I don't think we have time to broadcast the questions on the YouTube, but we will continue probably the conversation here informally. Uh, of course. So I'm, I'm sorry, I apologize for that, but let me just thank you again uh, for, for um, uh, we have just listened to Javier Mejia, Modernizing Elites in Latin America, Social Network Evidence from the Emergence of Banking in Antioquia. And please join us next Friday uh, with Professor Lynn Steven, who will talk about her new book, uh, Stories That Make History, Mexico Through Elena Poniatowska's Chronicas. So thank you so much. Perdón, Javier, but if you want to... <laughs>